Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what rules your life? What are the things that drive you and move you? What are your motivations? We might think that you know, we're motivated by family or our faith, but some philosophers believe that people are ruled by their passions, that you know, it doesn't matter what kinds of things are going on in your life, it's really those passions that take over. So people can be ruled by anger, by hatred, by fear and shame and envy. We see those things happening in the Old Testament lesson from Genesis 3. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, fell into rebellion, shame overcame them. They saw that they were naked and they tried to make clothing for themselves. They were afraid when they heard Jesus or God walking in the garden. And so they hid. All the things that they started to do were a result of what was ruling over them, their passions, their, their fears, the things that had resulted because of their sin. But as Christians, we know that God has given us something else, that we are not just slaves to sin, as it says in the book of Romans. Instead, God has given us a hope, a hope to overcome, a hope to be ruled by something other than the sin of the world and our passions. Instead, we can now be ruled by such things as love and meekness, confidence. We can be ruled by the fruit of the Spirit. These are the things that Jesus has given us. So how come, as Christians, we don't always live in that spirit? We don't always live in love and meekness and compassion. Why is it that we find ourselves stumbling and falling so often? Well, that's because the problem of sin is still with us. And yes, Jesus has saved us. He died on the cross. His, his passion was you. He had you in his sights when he was on the cross. He saw you as the apple of his eye so that you might be the one that gave him the motivation to die on the cross. It's interesting that that word passion is a word that we don't always understand when it's used in a theological term. Because this season of Lent is the season of, of passion. Not kind of the kind of passion that we think of when you fall in love, but instead it's the, the passion that is expressed in God's love going to the depths of the punishment on the cross. Jesus' passion was his taking sin into himself, experiencing the pain of death, and all because his passion was you. So there's two things involved there. There's the passion of the pain, there's also the passion of the love, all wrapped into one. During the season of Lent, we remember those things. We don't want to just say, oh, being a Christian is all you know, sunshine and roses. It is also the experience of persecution, and Jesus took that for us. That's why 19 years ago, when on Ash Wednesday, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, came out, that was such... A shock. I mean, so many people who saw it were like, they couldn't understand how he would show such a horrible picture. Some people even said it was, it was wrong to be portraying somebody being murdered like that as Jesus was going to the cross. And if you've seen it, I don't know if it's possible to not be moved by the movie, The Passion of the Christ. It does focus on all that Jesus underwent. Maybe we don't realize how much pain Jesus went through. And it wasn't just the pain of the crucifixion. It was the pain of the sin of the world, bearing down, crushing him, killing him, and the Father condemning that sin on the cross. That price that Jesus paid for our sins through all the trials of his life, was all for you and for me. In the very beginning of his walking to the cross, the very first steps were seen after his baptism as he went into the desert and was tempted by the devil. 
And so our text today is appropriate to understand what did Jesus have to undergo for us? You see, if Jesus is just an example, then we are just needing to follow the rules. But instead, we have to understand how temptation works because Jesus' temptation was for our benefit and for our victory. He didn't just do it so that we could follow in his footsteps, but instead he did it so that we might realize how difficult it is because on our own we could never do these things. So the devil brought about these temptations. The first one, he comes along and says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, it's interesting that he would try to question that. Jesus already knew that, and so did the demons. And so by bringing this up, he's really trying to, uh, trying to get to Jesus' motives. You know, pride can lead people to do all kinds of terrible things. In fact, I think the devil probably started with this because he himself fell because of pride. He wanted to be worshipped like God. So he's telling Jesus, you know, oh, I know you're God. You're the son of God. Why don't you start acting like it? It's almost like the devil saying to us, if you're the boss, if you are anyone who's in charge, then you would do such and such a thing. Or if you're my friend, you would act this way. You know, you'd affirm me in whatever thing I'm doing because that's what friends are supposed to do. Or if you're a good mother, then you will not punish or discipline your child because, oh, that's hurtful. And so the devil takes something that's true and turns it around. If you're a patriot, then this is the way you act. You have to stand up against anybody who brings about anything against our nation. If you're an expert, then you'll say this and you'll do this. If you're a team player, you'll compromise, you'll follow along, you'll do what everybody else is doing. If you really believe, then you'll do these things. And so the devil always has a list of things to do that is close to what it means to be that type of a person, a boss, a friend, a patriot, a spouse, but it often is misleading because it plays to our pride. We want to believe that, yes, that's the way we are, and we want to prove it by acting a certain way, and yet the things that the devil is listing and talking about, these are the things of the world. He is wrapping it in treachery. He takes something that's true, being a boss, being a friend, and then he wraps it in weakness. He wants to catch us off guard so that we might, in a time of weakness, fall to it. Jesus was hungry. He was fasting for 40 days. You can imagine how easy it would have been to say, you're right. It's time to eat. I can turn these stones into bread. And yet, by doing so, what would have been the penalty, the payment? The perfect Son of God would have fallen like Adam and Eve did. He would have just become another sinner in a long line of rebellion. And he would have lost all possibility of earning salvation, of paying for sins, of being the spotless Lamb of God. So he could not, and he would not, do that. But that second temptation that the devil used, it's interesting, he's quoting from Psalm 91. You know, if you uh, fall from this height, oh, the angels will catch you. And yes, there is a passage that says that. But Jesus knows that this psalm is not about testing God. It's about that God will protect us. And he does. I mean, how many times have you found yourself in a position where you didn't know what you were going to do or how it was going to turn out, but God came through. He delivered you. He saved you from a car accident, from financial ruin, even by answering our prayers and bringing us to health. And in those things, we can... Thank the Lord, for he will not allow us spiritually to strike our foot against a stone. But to test the Lord and to say, Lord, prove to me that you are God. It's almost like that prayer of a child saying, Lord, Jesus, if, if you help me pass my test, I promise I'll come to church more. You know, that kind of bargaining with God, that testing of God, 
That's immature faith. Maybe we find ourselves doing those types of things. God, I'll get into a prayer life when maybe things ease up at work. I'll get into devotions or a Bible study when, when I finally retire. And then once you're retired, Lord, maybe on a day when it's not so beautiful and I don't have to go golfing. You know, there's all kinds of reasons that we can come up with. But Jesus invites us to turn away those things for realizing our excuses, what they really are. They're testing God. But when it comes to that third uh, temptation, it almost seems like that's something that wouldn't even really work. How could the devil say, if you will worship me, then, then I'll give you the world? Did he, did he have the ability to give the world to Jesus? Well, in some ways, the world did belong to the devil. It had fallen into sin. It was under a curse. Yes, the world was evil. God destroyed everything with the flood of Noah. But after Noah, things didn't get any better. They continued to be evil. And so, yes, the devil did have that ability to say the, the world belongs to him. But he wouldn't have been able to give anything other than an evil world to Jesus. Jesus didn't come to just take over the world but to redeem the world. And so by looking for a shortcut, by saying, you know, Jesus, you know, devil, you're right. Why go to the cross? It's a lot of pain, a lot of effort. I could simply just do what you ask, and then you can hand it over to me, and then it'll be done. I'm sure that Jesus knew better than that. But, you know, that temptation to accomplish goals by less honorable means, that thing that we sometimes brush under the rug that the ends justify the means, is dangerous. State governments find it easier to get support for lotteries uh, than for school taxes. Casinos provide jobs for Native Americans, but they prey on the most vulnerable of our society. Executives enhance profits by firing loyal employees. Schools promote self-esteem by passing students to grades for which they are unprepared. Students pass tests by cheating. Preachers sometimes fill pews by promising to grow, that believers will grow rich rather than to take up their crosses and follow Jesus. There's all kinds of ways that we try to shortcut the way to our goals. And the devil knew that Jesus and his humanity was just as vulnerable. But those are the things that Jesus came to overcome for us. Jesus came to show us how to defeat temptation, and he uses two not-so-secret secrets to fend off the attacks. In essence, he simply gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. In our, in our uh, baptism, God has blessed us with kind of like a supernatural hearing so we can hear and understand the devil's tactics. When we are not believers, those things just seem normal. Isn't it just a normal thing to get what you want? To get ahead? To take advantage of people? But as Christ followers, we can't use people. They're not expendable. They're not just instruments for us to, to use as we work our way up the corporate ladder or through society. Instead, God calls us to say, say, yes, speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. It's a gift that we have. Now, Jesus was led into the desert by the Holy Spirit. We might even say, why in the world would the Holy Spirit lead him into this temptation? It's not because the devil or uh, the Holy Spirit wanted him to fall, but it was for the purpose of doing that which Israel could not do. You see, they were in the wilderness for 40 years, and they failed every temptation. It says in the book of Numbers that God was testing them. And so the word for temptation in Greek is actually the same as the word for testing. To tempt or to test. We say that in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. And so that word can mean testing. Lead us not into testing because only God allows testing because he only wants us to be strengthened and for us to overcome. But when that word is used from the perspective of evil, the devil is the only one who tempts because his goal is that we would fail. And so 
In both ways, we are asking God to protect us, to strengthen us through his testing, and also to stop the devil and his desire to make us fall through temptation. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who's working, and he uses the means of the Bible. So that's what Jesus used. He didn't come up with his own ideas and say, you know, I think that I can make it another day, 41 days of fasting before I make it to Jerusalem and eat. Instead, he says, God's word says. So scripture is one of those important weapons, the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. And God's word is right along there as one of those weapons for us to use to protect ourselves. But the problem is that we lack biblical literacy. Our world lacks it. You see, the Bible is a tool, kind of like, you know, if you had a toolbox, you could do a lot of stuff with it. But without actually using it, it doesn't really do you any good. I was watching a lot of uh, uh, DIY, do-it-yourself shows over the last uh, couple of days was raining and watched this uh, family, I think it was in Europe, and they built a house from scratch. They just used some kind of special foam blocks. And it was a two-story house, and within like 20 minutes, the, they showed them building this entire house. I was like, I could do that. <laughs> well, they made it look so simple. But if I were given the tools and the, and the building materials and just said, okay, you start ahead, and go ahead and do it, I would just be lost. I mean, I'm sure that there's a time elapsed and it took them maybe a week, but still, I mean, each one of us takes God's word and we don't always know what to do with it, but you have to put it into practice. You have to put it into action. You have to allow God's word to make its way into your vocabulary as you read the Bible so that when the temptations come, you know what to say, you are reminded by the Holy Spirit of the words that you've read so that you might overcome temptation. So why is it important to be in church all the time or to read God's word? It's because that is the toolbox that the Holy Spirit will use when the temptations come. <clears throat> and we always need to be in training. We always need to be prepared for the devil's attacks. Are we in training? I think that that's what we're doing right now. I mean, church isn't just about making us feel good. It's a preparation for being out of these walls because the mission field begins when you step back out. And we go into that mission field every week. Not only to share the word, but also to overcome the problems that we'll experience. So does your faith have faith? Do you have faith? the ability to trust that God is with you even in these difficult times. And when you face temptation, are you able to overcome them? Or do you think that it's all up to you? See, to have a faith that has faith is to say, I know that God is with me even when I don't feel it, even when I don't see it. You know, think like Job. The temptation that Job had was to say, God must have abandoned me. Because I didn't do anything wrong to deserve this horrible life that came about after I lost my family members, I lost all my income, and then I lost my health. And he sat there on the ash heap. And his friends came and told him, you know, you must have done something horrible because God only punishes sinners. And that's not necessarily true. He doesn't just punish sinners. He, we live in a cursed world, and sometimes we're victims of sin. And so it doesn't mean that everything that happens to us we deserved, and we need to just do better. See, that's karma. That's not Christianity. The fact that we live in a cursed world is why we see evil around us, but God has the victory. Even when you don't see the victory in your own life, you don't see yourself moving forward in overcoming temptation. You don't see the changes, but they're happening when we give it over to the Lord. When we say, Lord, I messed up again. Maybe some of you remember the, uh, the book called The Shack, and maybe the theology is not the greatest in that book, but I remember reading a section of it that was very helpful. And it was where Jesus was rejoicing over the, the man who was the main character. He kept saying, you know, I keep blowing it in my life. I, I keep messing up. I'm a bad husband. I'm a bad father. And Jesus was smiling. He said, why are you smiling? You don't care that I'm, not strugg that I'm struggling? What's going on? I don't see myself improving, and I hate it. And Jesus said, 
because you don't see what I see. I see that of the maybe the hundred times that you're ha having to overcome this temptation in your life, that you're at number 90. You're getting closer. You're almost there. And I already know that I've already paid for your sins and that you will overcome that problem in your life. So don't give up because I know that you're there getting closer every day. What an awesome way of understanding what it means to face temptation. Because you are not a victim. You have not failed. God is working in you and through you to do his good will. To be a blessing to those around you and to be a blessing to this world. We need that more and more. Thanks be to God to see how people in our country and around the world are starting to come alive through the work of the Spirit. Now, I, I'm not too sure what is going to come of what we've been seeing. If you're familiar with the Asbury University, uh, they, they're calling it the outpouring, kind of a revival that's happening in college campuses, not only in the United States, but around the world. And to know that this is of God is only to see it continue to work in people's lives. We don't need to give up on this world because God hasn't. Otherwise, Jesus would have been back already. In fact, God is still at work. He's overcoming temptations. He's freeing souls. He's bringing about victory over temptation. And we don't have to allow our faith only to be as strong as the last time that God's power was seen in our life. Don't say like the friends of Job, Oh, you need to work harder and be better in order for God to bless you. No, the blessings are there even in the pain because God is making our faith stronger. So we might be able to say the temptation to only trust in God when things are going good is one I'm not going to fall for. Devil, you don't know what it's about. He had no love for the Lord. He was cast out of heaven. But our love for our Savior is seen not only in the fact that Jesus says, this is how you overcome temptation, but that I have already become the victor over temptation and sin and death. Jesus invites us to be connected to him. He carries us through the problems. He frees us from the sin in this world. It doesn't mean we stop sinning. It just means we do not have to worry about the consequences of those sin. For we are still children of God. Because Jesus overcame his temptations in our text today, we can too. But he also loves you more than you'll ever know. Because he'll be there to pick you up when you fail and to remind you that it's not too late. He is helping us to, win, to run the race, to win the victory that he has already accomplished for us through his death and resurrection. Thanks be to God for Jesus is overcoming all temptations so that he knows what you're going through and you can trust him. In Jesus' name, amen.